Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today I'm continuing in the study of the book of John, and I'm going to pick up where I left off last time, uh, starting with uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Now, if you did not see the previous studies on John, uh, I hope you will go back and watch this from the beginning. Uh, all the other videos are already available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Uh, now, I'm a KJV first, just so I'll first read the verse in the KJV. And if I think it may be helpful, then I may read it also in the Amplified Translation. So let's begin. John chapter 12, verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Hmm. Well, so um, Lazarus is raised from the dead, and he's back with his family and uh, at, the, at the dinner table with everyone else. Um, now, the sisters of Lazarus, Mary and Martha, um, the, the, this Mary is one of the three Marys in the Bible. Uh, Mary, the sister of Lazarus, Mary, Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of Jesus. Uh, but sometimes people confuse these three, and, and also the people confuse this question about Mary Magdalene, who was she? Was she a prostitute? It's commonly believed in Roman Catholicism and, and other, other people also. Uh, they just jump to the conclusion that Mary Magdalene was the prostitute uh, that... Uh, um, but I don't see any indication in the scriptures where that supports that at all. Um, this particular part about um, a woman who puts the ointment on Jesus, um, many people think that this woman was looked down upon because she was a prostitute. And yet we read here that this is Mary, the, uh, the sister of Lazarus and Martha, and the, these three are, are highly respected. There's nothing to indicate that uh, this Mary was a prostitute. And yet she's the one that we find uh, anointing Jesus with her, uh, the ointment. Let me, let me read these first few verses in the Amplified. Uh, six days before the Passover, Jesus went to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom he had raised from the dead. So they gave a supper for him there. Martha was serving, and uh, Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Then Jesus took a pound of very expensive perfume of pure nard, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Well, I don't think we learn anything really new from the Amplified there, even though what I like about the Amplified is it, it, it does amplify the verse. We get a little more information, and it's the, uh, the opinion of these translators that wrote the Amplified, uh, how they amplify it or expound upon the verse. Uh, sometimes it's helpful. In this case, uh, I don't really see anything uh, uh, that helpful. Let's look at the back to the KJV, verse 4. It says, Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. 
why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. Had the bag means that he was uh, holding the money for the for, for, for the, 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 the group, the, the, for Jesus and for also the apostles and disciples, those who were traveling together, uh, they had uh, some money to cover their expenses and Judas was kind of the treasurer of the group and uh, they trusted him with the money and yet he's the one that they shouldn't have trusted because he was dishonest. He was a thief, it says here. So he's questioning, why waste this money on Jesus? This is foolishness. We should sell it and give the money to the poor. But it says here in the scriptures that you know, his real motivation was he didn't want the money to go to the poor. He wanted it in his treasure, in his bag, because uh, he stole from that bag. He kind of, I guess you could call it embezzlement. Verse 7, then said Jesus, let her alone. Again, against the day of my bearing hath she kept this. So Jesus comes to Mary's defense and tells Judas, don't bother her about this. The, the reason that she's doing this is, is preparation for my burial, which... Uh, should get everybody's attention. He's, he's mentioned it numerous times before, but it kind of goes in one ear and out the other ear of these apostles. Verse 8 says, <clears throat> Jesus still speaking, <clears throat> for the poor always ye have with ye, with you. But me ye have not always. Well, um, the poor you always have with you. Well, this is certainly not talking about always and uh, including eternity. But uh, until the end times, the, the, until the last day, uh, between what Jesus said then, and matter of fact, throughout all of the history of mankind, there always have been, there always will be, a group of people that are poor they have less than others and either very little to get by on or not enough to get by on and they 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 suffer but uh he says you'll always have this so, so i i think we should realize that all the attempts of of uh, humanity and the human government uh to help the poor and alleviate poverty <clears throat> It's uh, it's it's impossible, according to Jesus. It says we'll always have these poor people within society. There's always going to be a percentage of people who are poor. Uh, of course, we we know that in the last day, at the resurrection and the the judgment, the new heavens and the new earth, and living on into eternity. At that time, there will be no poverty, there will be no poor, there will be no sickness or death or crying or mourning or tears. No, all those things will be gone. So thank you, Jesus. That's, this is what we can look forward to. <clears throat> but until then, we'll always have some poor people, no matter how uh, how hard man attempts to, to, to help his fellow man out of this poverty, uh, we'll never be able to completely solve the problem. But he says, but ye, me, ye have not always. Again, in eternity, we always have Jesus, but there will be a time. There's a time from his crucifixion to his resurrection. There's a three-day period where they did not have him. And then after the resurrection, there's a 40-day period where he's with the apostles and the believers again for 40 days and then there's an ascension and now he's in heaven sitting at the right hand of the father 
And, and in this present time, we do not have him with us. He has the Holy Spirit. Uh, he is sent to, to uh, live in the believers and to be our comforter. Uh, so we presently we have the Holy Spirit, but Jesus is not here on the earth. So we don't have him now. But in eternity, of course, we will have Jesus again. So there are certain gaps, certain periods of time where this will apply. It's, he says, me, ye have not always, not all of the time, I will I be with you. <clears throat> uh, verse 9, much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. So, I mean, could you imagine a... Nobody's been raised from the dead before, except uh, I think there's one or two cases in the Old Testament. I believe it was Elijah that did resurrections. Um, but throughout the history of man, you don't have these resurrections. You have other mirac miraculous things happened uh, in, in the ministry of Jesus. There's already been numerous miracles, healings, and feeding the multitudes and, and uh, all, all these wonderful miracles he's doing as a sign to prove he is uh, the promised one. He is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. Uh, God manifest in the flesh, the only Savior, the only source of life everlasting. Uh, these are his claims, and he did the miracles and signs to prove his claims were true. Uh, and yet, uh, uh, there was no resurrections among these miracles except Lazarus. So this is a big deal. So could you imagine if, if there was a resurrection in your town? Um, could you imagine all the people that would want to go witness it and see the person that was raised from the dead? <clears throat> Verse 10, but the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. Oh, gosh. The chief priests, a priest. You think that a priest would have a higher level of spiritual uh, awareness, understanding, and yet they don't. And... Um, particularly this group of peace, of priests in the Sanhedrin, uh, in the, the, uh, the, 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 the Pharisees, these religious people were very blind spiritually. Jesus mentions numerous times in John about how uh, he, he says something that confounds them and they want to take him literally when he says, don't you understand spiritual talk? This is spiritual language I'm using. It's not to be taken literally. Uh, the uh, when they said give us a sign and Jesus said uh, to uh, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up they immediately thought he was talking about the physical building the, uh, the temple in Jerusalem but he says no I'm talking about my body about talking about the death, burial, and resurrection of my body. And, and that's one example of many. But he, he said a lot of things that they just didn't understand because I guess they were so filled with spiritual pride and uh, self-righteousness. They didn't have enough, the humility. That's why he spoke in parables, so that if only a person who would be have uh, had humility could understand. Um, so they wanted to kill Lazarus. He died once. Jesus raised him from the dead. And now they think he should be put to death too. Verse 11, because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. <clears throat> so they thought that killing Lazarus would be justified because uh, this resurrection of Lazarus caused many of the Jews to believe in Jesus. So they, they thought that was justification for killing Lazarus. 
Verse 12, on the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. I'm going to read that verse, uh, verse 12 and 13. I want to read that in the Amplified. <clears throat> it's a title. Uh, the Amplified has titles for chapters and, and uh, subtitles within the chapters. <clears throat> and it says, the triumphal entry is the title for this portion. It says, the next day, when the large crowd who had come to the Passover feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees in homage to him as king and went out to meet him. And they began shouting and kept shouting, Hosanna, blessed, uh, celebrated, praised is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. <clears throat> Still need this. I haven't gotten rid of this throat problem. Okay. Let's go back uh, to KJV. It says, uh, verse 14, and Jesus when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, thy king cometh, sitting on a, an ass's colt. Uh, a lot can be said about this. Uh, this verse here, this prophecy, this fulfillment of prophecy, uh, some people could probably expand on this for an hour or two, uh, giving you the significant details of this particular prophecy. But I'll just leave it at this, uh, that um, this is a quote from the Old Testament. Let me see if it, how it phrases it in the Amplified. It says, And Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it, just as it is written in Scripture, do not fear, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Let's see if there's a footnote on that here. Uh, no, there's no footnote, and uh, there's no reference to the where this is in the Old Testament. I don't know off the top of my head, but this is a, a prophetic verse that is being quoted from the Old Testament uh, about the Messiah coming into town, triumphant, uh, riding on a donkey's colt. Um, verse 16 in the KJV, these things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, that means after the, his bodily resurrection, then remember they that these things were written of him and that they had done these things unto him. Verse 17, the people therefore that was with him when he called Lazarus out of, the, out of his grave and raised him from the dead bear record. For this cause, the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. Uh, I'm going to read that in the Amplified. Verse 16. The, his disciples do not understand the meaning of these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified and exalted, they remembered 
that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. So had been written about him, that means it was written, uh, you know, centuries before. Some of these prophecies come from David, uh, who lived uh, a thousand years before Jesus. Uh, some from Isaiah, who lived 700 years before Jesus and other prophets too. <clears throat> um, I'm not sure, as I said, uh, where this particular verse uh, comes from, but the Bible is full of it. There's, I don't recall the exact number, but I think there's over 300 uh, verses in the Old Testament uh, uh, prophesying that uh, this Messiah would come. And, and then not only he would come, but many specific details about him, describing him and describing uh, his life and things he would do and his death, burial, and resurrection. These are all recorded centuries before Jesus. And, and then uh, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, of course, that was the, that's a fulfillment of a Old Testament prophecy. <clears throat> but um, all these things that were written about him before as Jesus was born and lived his life, each one of these prophecies were fulfilled. And statisticians, mathematicians have done calculations on the odds of something being predicted in the future and then actually being fulfilled. And then not only the odds of one of them, but the odds of many of these. And the, the odds are astronomical. These, this is one of the great proofs that gives us confidence that the Bible is the word of God. I have a playlist titled... Uh, Prophecies, uh, Prophecies in the Bible, I think is the title of the playlist. <clears throat> but uh, the idea of God uh, writing, having something written down, and then, uh, you know, decades, even centuries, even millennia later, uh, it being fulfilled exactly. And then not only is it happening once or twice, but over and over and over again, hundreds of times, <clears throat> get this is the this is uh, what God has done so that we can have confidence in the Bible and know that this truly is not just a, an ordinary book, it, but it is the word of God. Uh, verse um, 17, the people therefore that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead bear record for this cause, the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. Uh, the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world has gone after him. So the Pharisees are getting quite upset as Jesus gets more and more followers. Uh, and verse 20, and there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. <clears throat> uh, these are Greeks who are um, also Jews. Uh, and they, verse 21, the, the same came bef therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, well, we would see Jesus. They're asking to see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Again, he's talking about death, burial, and resurrection here. <clears throat> that's what it means to him that this, this hour that's coming where he will be glorified. <clears throat> and yet these people, they even when Jesus is really quite explicit saying they're going to kill me and, I, and I'll be raised from the dead is as in plain language. It just seems like it goes in one ear out the other and they, they just don't, uh, it doesn't register. They, and sometimes if it does register, they, they reject it, say they won't allow that to happen. <clears throat> Verse 24. <clears throat> uh, 
Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Uh, let's read that in the Amplify, verse 24. Uh, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone, just one grain, never more. But if it dies, it produces much grain and yields a harvest. So, of course, he's talking about his death, and because of his death, many people will, will, uh, will receive life. Uh, he dies, he's resurrected, he's called the, fir the first fruit uh, of the resurrection, and then I am going to follow you, are going to, you who believe in Jesus, we will all follow eventually at the day of the resurrection, we will all be raised. And this is what this is all really alluding to. Um, verse 25, he that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it into unto life eternal. <clears throat> Verse 25 in the Amplified says, uh, the one who loves his life eventually loses it through death. That's inevitable. We're all going to die unless you happen to be living at the day of the resurrection. Those who are alive at the time of the resurrection they they will be glorified they will receive uh their bodies will be transformed into glorified bodies that will never die and that happens uh, uh at the same time that the, the the people who have already died will be resurrected with glorified bodies <clears throat> this is coming in in the future could be very soon um And, and then it says, uh, but the one who hates his life in this world and is concerned with pleasing God will keep it for life eternal. <clears throat> so I think hating his life just means it's just um, not, not um, being focused on um, uh, living for yourself, um, thinking that it's all about you and not having a relationship with God, thinking that God is unnecessary and not understanding the, the true purpose of your even your birth and all of the purpose of all of creation is for us to be, have this love relationship with Jesus. If people who don't, uh, don't ever recognize that, uh, then uh, it says the one who hates his life in this world and, and is concerned with pleasing God, uh, will keep it for life eternal. So if you say, these things I don't value, what's really value valuable is eternal life, is eternity with God, the creator, the saint, Jesus, my savior. Uh, when your person recognize that and they get the priority right, that's when they, uh, they can receive eternal life because now they're putting their faith and trust in Jesus instead of just uh, uh, thinking that, uh, you know, God is really irrelevant and uh, they'll just, they get by fine without him. Verse 26 in the KJV says, if any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now, uh, is this my now is my soul troubled? And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause, I came into, uh, I came unto this hour. <clears throat> um, another reference of Jesus saying why he came. Why did he come down from heaven? Jesus said. Uh, do not think I came to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. So Jesus says he came down from heaven, he became a man. The point was 
to serve us. How does he serve us? Well, he, he, the, the greatest service of all you can give is, is, is to give your life for, for a friend, he says. So being willing to die, he says, to give my life is a ransom. A ransom is a payment made to set someone free. Uh, and this is this is why he came down from him. This is why he became a man. And it's it could also, uh, the same point is made here in this verse. Uh, now is my soul troubled and what shall I say? So, you know, he's troubled thinking about, you know, uh, obviously he knows the future. He knows his, his, uh, his death on that cross is imminent and it's got to trouble him being a man and God. This humanity in Jesus is troubled. And he says, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, of course not, because, because that's the point of him coming. The reason he came was to die. So he's certainly not going to say, rescue me from this death. I don't want to die. That's the whole reason he came. For But for this cause came I unto this hour. Verse 28, Father, glorify thy name. Uh, then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. <clears throat> so here you have another example of, uh, of the, uh, the triunity, the trinity. The, we, we, in this example, we don't have uh, the Holy Spirit uh, represented as we do in the, uh, of the baptism of Jesus, where you have the Holy Spirit ascending in the manner of a dove, Jesus bodily being baptized, the Father's voice speaking, saying, this is uh, my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Um, in that case, you have all three personages of this Godhead um, all simultaneously interacting. Uh, but in this case, we have two of the three. It says Jesus is there and then the voice of the Father. So these are the reasons that modalism to me is, uh, even though there's a lot of verses that modalists can use to, to support their viewpoint that uh, there's one God and he just changes into three modes of operation. Jesus is, is that God and sometimes he, uh, He's the Father, sometimes he's the Son, sometimes he's the Holy Spirit. This is modalism or uh, Sibelianism. And, uh, it was, the idea was originated by someone named Sibelius. But this, this viewpoint, and they give Jesus credit for being eternal God Almighty, but they don't differentiate. And there's no distinction between Jesus and the Father because Jesus is the Father in their viewpoint. But here, when you have examples like this, it disproves modalism because you have Jesus not just changing into the Father. And if you see in modalism, he's changing into one form and leaving behind the other form. He's, he's, uh, he's not simultaneously the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He just changes into one person and then the next and then the next. But here in this example and the baptism, he's simultaneously. You can see that they're existing simultaneously. Um, and then verse 30, Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes, so that everybody around could hear the voice. Uh, just, just another miraculous sign as uh, evidence of who Jesus is. <clears throat> verse 31. Uh, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. <coughs> the prince of this world, the devil. So it says, now the devil is going to be cast out. And he's cast out, he's defeated by this. Jesus' death for our sins. In verse 32, it says, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And verse 33, This he said, signifying what death he should die. So he's nailed to the cross. The cross is lifted up. 
he's lifted up from the earth, and in this manner, he's drawing all men to himself. Uh, as he's on that cross, suffering and dying, he's saying, come to me. Come to me. This is why I came, to embrace you, to give you life. Let me read these verses here in the Amplified. Uh, um, verse 30, Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Uh, now judgment has come upon this world. The sentence is being passed. Um, now the ruler of this world, Satan, will be cast out. And I, if I, if and when I am lifted up from the earth on the cross, will draw all people to myself, Gentiles, as well as Jews. Mm -hmm. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. Okay, verse 34 in the KJV says, uh, the people answered him, we have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how saith thou, the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? Verse 34. <clears throat> I think I better end just because my voice is giving out here. Uh, I'll pick it up next time with verse uh, 34. Let me make a note of that. John 12. 34. <clears throat> I want to just save a, a couple of minutes here to tell you the, the good news. If you haven't heard it already, uh, Bible study is fascinating. It's exhilarating, really. Uh, learning uh, what God has for us in the scriptures. The words of God. The Bible is called the Word of God, but it's the words of God. It's uh, the Bible is a history book, the history of uh, the creation of man and uh, the history of man, the history of God interacting with man, the the promise of God uh, redeeming mankind, providing salvation for lost man. Uh, this is what we find in the Bible. It's all it's all beautiful. And wonderful to study it and learn about it but there's one thing in the bible that rises above every other theme and this is the the question of salvation what must i do to be saved what must i do so i get to go to heaven have you ever asked yourself that god what do you want from me what what do i have to do so i can go to heaven most people haven't studied the bible and learned what the Bible says about this. How does the Bible answer this question? How does Jesus answer the question? And a uh, typical person, I've, I've asked hundreds of people, thousands of people probably over the years, uh, do you think you're gonna go to heaven? And if so, why? And almost everybody answers the question, well, I, I, I'm not sure if I'm going to heaven, I'm hopeful. I, I can't, no one can be certain, but I, I think I might go to heaven because I'm a good person. Most people think that going to heaven is, is a reward, uh, something that they achieve. It's something that's earned based upon a person living a good life. And they think of it in terms of relative goodness, uh, they think if you're relatively good, like you're one of the better people, then God will say you're acceptable and you get to come to heaven. But the people who are not quite good enough or especially the, the very bad people, they don't get to go to heaven. Uh, but that's that's a philosophy of man. That's a, that's That's a lie from the devil. That's not what the Bible tells us. The Bible says you are trying to uh, establish your own righteousness as a means of salvation, but that's not God's way. God's way is 
accepting the fact that uh, you cannot get to heaven through your own righteousness. And that's why you need to be saved. That's why you need to be rescued. That's why you need Jesus. And the Bible says that we only go to heaven uh, if we receive salvation as a gift. And the good news is that Jesus is offering you heaven, eternal life in heaven. Actually, the heaven will be on earth. The Bible tells us that in the future, the heavens and the earth will be destroyed. God will create a new heaven and new earth. God will live on earth with us in paradise forever and ever. Kind of like Adam and Eve, but better. And, and this is what God has for you. Joy and bliss and happiness in a perfect world forever and ever. And he offers it to you as a free gift. No, you don't have to work for it. In fact, it's po impossible to gain it by working for it. When I say working, I'm talking about, oh, I'm going to really um, try really hard not to be bad. I'm in, and I'm going to do a lot of good things. If I can just get my bad deeds down and minimize that, abstain from bad and do a lot of good, that's working. That's salvation by works, by, by your own effort. Uh, but you can't do that. The Bible says it's impossible. Jesus said it's impossible to get, get to heaven that way. But salvation is offered as a gift a free gift. And it, well, if you understand that, and if this is news to you now, if this is good news, that's what the Bible calls it. The gospel is a Greek word that means the good news. The good news is that you can't get to heaven through your own efforts, but God loves you so much. He'll give you heaven as a gift if you'll trust Jesus. No longer put your faith in your own ability to work your way to heaven. Instead, put your faith in the ability of Jesus. Believe that he's the only one that's able to get you into heaven. Put, put your faith in Jesus. Believe that he will do it because he promised it and he's faithful. And when you put your faith in him, at that instant, you get the guarantee of eternal life in heaven instantaneously and it's irrevocable by God or by us the Bible says God will not change his mind and ever take it back from you and it says that you can't lose it for anything you do so it's irreversible once you put your faith in Jesus isn't that wonderful I hope you'll do it now trust Jesus he loves you so much he died for you and then he raised himself from the dead as a sign to prove he is God. He is the Savior. He does have power over life and death. You, that gives us the confidence that our faith in him is justified. Thank you for watching. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.